Welcome to Keep the Faith Ministry. Keep the Faith brings you timely messages with in-depth spiritual analysis of current events in light of Bible prophecy so you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. Listen to what the news won't tell you. Here is another important message for our times. This is Pastor Hal Mayer. Dear friends, special Christian greetings to you and your family this month. We really appreciate your prayers and support. May the Lord continue to bless and keep you in His loving care. As we near the end of this year, I want to remind you that you must resubscribe to Keep the Faith to continue your subscription in 2008. We only ask this once every year or two to be sure that all of our subscribers actually want to receive our monthly sermons and prophecy updates. You must send back the little card by December 31, 2007, so that your subscription will not lapse. So be sure and send in your yellow card this month if you haven't done so already. If you have resubscribed, you can also share the yellow card with those not on our monthly list. Just ask them to write new subscriber on the card and we will treat it that way. Also, some time ago, we sent you a DVD about Heartland College. I hope by now you have had the opportunity to watch it and have shared it with someone else. So many have commented to me about the blessing they received and how heartwarming the DVD was. If you would like another copy to share with someone else, please feel free to ask for it. We will be glad to send it to you. Lastly, on one of our recent sermons, Secret Forces of the Church, Rome's Foot Soldiers, I failed to mention that some of the material presented in that sermon was triggered by the excellent research of my friends at the Eternal Gospel Herald. Though I always attempt to verify everything from publicly available sources, there are times when excellent research tips me off to important developments. We will continue to keep our eyes open and share with you the important progress in prophecy. As we near the close of time, it is clear that the forces of evil are at work to distance God's people from the truth. It is amazing to me that the devil is going through so much so that he can one day make a last effort to crush a small group of faithful souls who love Jesus with all their hearts. Think about this for a minute. Satan has been going through a worldwide program of ramping up methods and technology at enormous expense just so he can have it available to persecute God's faithful people when the time comes. He is working very hard through his earthly agencies to bring the whole world under his control, some directly and some indirectly. He is also building a worldwide religious coalition through the ecumenical movement so that it will be very difficult for God's true people who don't go along with this fake love ecumenical movement and escape persecution and condemnation. These are very expensive and long-range plans and as we near the climax of it all, we must realize that only the angels of heaven are holding back the winds of strife. This month we're going to explore more of the workings of Satan's agencies to deceive and destroy the very ones on whom God bestows his supreme regard. Before we close, I'm going to share with you an explosive and shocking statement that reveals what is planned for God's true people. May God bless you as we study together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come to you today seeking for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to guide us into the truth for this time, to show us where we are, as unfolding events herald the nearness of Jesus' return. Please, Father, open our eyes. Help us see that the time is now to purify our lives. Give us an understanding of our faith more fully. You continue to lead us each day, and we see your hand in our lives, and so we pray that you will open prophecy to us in a more powerful way today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 18th chapter of Revelation, verses 1 through 8. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. 
and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, double unto her double, according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. What an amazing prediction of Scripture. Rome says, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. And as you will see today, Rome's arrogance is one of her secret forces. Through it, she lifts herself up politically and religiously. Through it, she shall be brought down into a great destruction. But in this passage, we read a message that is very important in relation to God's people at the end of time. An angel represents a message given by God's people. The message of the angel of Revelation 18 is the last and final message before the destruction of the papacy, the arrogant queen of the earth. It is a message for all of God's true people to come out of her and be separate from Rome and join those giving the message. Notice that there's going to be a huge contrast between the message of God's faithful people and the message of Rome. One is to come out of her and repent. The other is that she is sitting as a queen and that all must come under her authority. Notice, too, that the final warning message to come out of her is given just before Rome's final destruction. And lastly, notice that a conflict will rage between the giant modern Goliath and the small but powerful band that give the message. Rome is working to regain her position as queen of the earth, she is doing everything she can politically and religiously to place herself at the head of the world. In the end, all the many and varied forces that will oppose her in the world, such as secularism and radical Islam, etc., will not rise to the same level as those who give the powerful message of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. For those who don't know it, the first three angels' messages are found in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. These are wonderful passages to study, and they involve very much indeed. But today we shall examine more closely the arrogance that the Scripture predicts will characterize Rome's final assault on God and His truth. On June 29, 2007, Benedict XVI released a document in which he again suggested that those churches that are not in communion with the Bishop of Rome are not true churches in the proper sense. This dealt a blow to other religious groups, especially Protestants. Many Protestant groups were very upset. Here they are in ecumenical dialogue with Rome, some of them for 30 years or so. And now they're being told that they're not on equal spiritual footing with Rome and that they are somehow inferior. The new document actually comes from the former office of the Holy Inquisition, now known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and can be found on the Vatican website. The document was written in a question-and-answer format. Here is what the Vatican actually said in the new doctrinal statement clarifying its position concerning the meaning of the Church. It says that Christ established here on earth only one Church and instituted it as a visible and spiritual community, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. This means that the Catholic Church believes itself to be the only true visible church on earth. 
The Catholic Catechism says similarly in item 846 that basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church is necessary for salvation. They could not be saved who, knowing that it was founded as necessary for salvation, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. This is saying that the rite of baptism in the Catholic Church is essential to salvation, and that salvation can only be gained when in her communion. This is an absolute blasphemy. The Bible teaches that the only way to salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, not through ritual and ceremony or some earthly structure. Though baptism is important as a public testimony of one's conversion to Jesus Christ, it does not add any virtue to the soul or provide any merit. One can be saved without it. Jesus himself taught this when he was making the supreme sacrifice on the cross. You may remember that he said to the thief that he would be with him in paradise even though he would have no opportunity to be baptized. The Catholic Church in other words, is claiming to hold the keys of salvation, a prerogative that is usurped from Christ himself. This is nothing new. The Catholic Church has claimed this blasphemous power since time immemorial. The new document goes on to say that there are numerous elements of sanctification and of truth which are found in churches outside her structure, but which, as gifts properly belonging to the Church of Christ, meaning the Catholic Church, impel these other churches toward Catholic unity. These separated churches and communities, though we believe they suffer from defects, the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as instruments of salvation, whose value derives from that fullness of grace and of truth which has been entrusted to the Catholic Church. In other words, because Christ is working in, in these other communions with elements of grace that supposedly belong to the Roman Catholic Church, it is the alleged purpose of the Holy Spirit in using them in these other communions to impel or push them toward conversion or unity with the Catholic faith. Here is how the Catechism puts it. Many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside the visible confines of the Catholic Church. The written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, charity, with the other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as the visible elements. Christ's Spirit uses these churches and ecclesial communities as means of salvation, whose power derives from the fullness of grace and truth that Christ has entrusted to the Catholic Church. All these blessings come from Christ and lead to Him, and are in themselves calls to Catholic unity. So you see, Rome claims all the gifts of the Holy Spirit as her possession, supposedly given to her by Christ, and teaches that they all arise from her when the Holy Spirit uses them in these other communions, so that they will return to her in repentance and submit to her authority. Rome has to believe and teach these things. It is absolutely impossible for the prophecy of her to rise to the heights of power and to sit as a queen upon the earth to be fulfilled unless she has some theological or dogmatic teaching that will support her as the only church invested with God's authority on earth. This blasphemous teaching is very real today, as it has always been since the 6th century. Without it, Rome has no power. The implications of this are important to understand in light of the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement, then, must only be defined as a movement of the Protestant churches and other communions toward Rome, and ultimately to full, visible, sacramental communion with Rome, not a movement of Rome toward them. For any Protestant church to be involved in the ecumenical movement, then, would be an effort to move that church toward Rome in a blasphemous denial of their faith. Most people don't have any awareness that this is the underlying purpose of the ecumenical movement. They think that Rome is somehow different now than it was in the past, and that we can trust Rome, and that the Vatican is now the friend of Protestants. Listen to this important statement. It's found in Great Controversy, page 571. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be. 
the apostasy of the latter times, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose, but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy. She declares, Shall this power whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as part of the Church of Christ? The new document also says that according to Catholic doctrine, these Protestant communities do not enjoy apostolic succession in the sacrament of orders, and are therefore deprived of a constitutive element of the Church. Because they lack a priesthood in communion with the Bishop of Rome through the Eucharist, these Protestant communities cannot, according to Catholic doctrine, be called churches in the proper sense. They are somehow defective, according to Rome. Do you think that people who have no clear concept of what the Protestant Reformation was will feel insecure in their faith and in their church if Rome can convince them that they are somehow defective? When people lack a knowledge of the facts of history, and when they lack the convictions that made them what they are, they easily become insecure about their faith, and will look to Rome as the religious standard. But there's a pecking order, as far as Rome is concerned. The Eastern Church, or the Orthodox Churches, are a cut above the other separated communities. The Orthodox Churches are considered by Rome to be actual churches, as the new document says, and I quote, because these churches, although separated, have the true sacraments, and above all, because of the apostolic succession, the priesthood and the Eucharist, by means of which they remain linked to us, they merit the title of particular or local churches, and are called sister churches. However, since communion with the Catholic Church, the visible head of which is the Bishop of Rome, and the successor of Peter, is one of its internal constitutive principles. These venerable Christian communities lack something in their condition as particular churches. In other words, Rome sees these churches that have the ritual of the Eucharist Mass as better than the Protestant churches, but there is still something lacking because they are not under the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Rome obviously claims that the ritual Eucharistic Mass belongs to her and comes from her, so the churches that use her ritual technically have apostolic succession, but are separated because of schism. By contrast, the Protestant communities, the document says, do not enjoy apostolic succession in the sacrament of orders, and are therefore deprived of all constitutive elements of the church. So if any church or individual allows Rome to define the meaning of church based on her own terms, which are the mass and loyalty to the Pope, Rome then controls the discussion, and eventually all unity must inevitably involve full and visible and sacramental communion with the Church of Rome. Rome essentially sets herself up as the head of all the churches. This title was given to her by a human emperor named Justinian in 533 AD. But Rome treats it as if she was given this title by God, and she has never forgotten to claim that prerogative. Nearly 1,500 years later, she still speaks of herself as the head and judge of all other churches. The Roman Catholic Church essentially sets herself up as holier than thou and tries to keep other churches at a psychological disadvantage. This arrogance reflects her own view of herself, a view that is described in the Bible. I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Revelation 18.7 This is also the way the Vatican relates to other nations. She sets herself up as superior to them, as queen over them. It is impossible for God's people living in the last days to be involved in any aspect of the ecumenical movement and escape the condemnation and plagues found in Revelation 18, 4 through 8. Double unto her double, torment and sorrow, and mourning and famine. The ecumenical movement has been one of Rome's key tools to increase her power by reducing opposition to her in politics and to her faith. 
particularly in Protestant countries. The ecumenical movement is designed to bring these separated communions into league with her as daughters in harlotry, as the scripture says in Revelation 17. Speaking of the great whore, the apostle reveals what he saw in vision about the papacy. Verses 5 and 6 say, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Bible prophecy reveals to us that a woman is a church. No other church in history has persecuted and shed the blood of godly men and women more than the papacy. No other church in history has done so much to blaspheme God, his truth, and his principles, all the while claiming to be the church of Christ, yet crucify him, crucifying him afresh. The Pope has developed quite a habit of criticizing other religions. And back in September of 2006, Benedict criticized Muslims by quoting a reference from a medieval emperor that inflamed the Muslim world. For more on that, request our sermon entitled, Benedict Lights a Fuse. The Pope then reached out to Muslims and even had a joint prayer service in a mosque in Turkey. When he went to Brazil in May of 2007, the Pope outraged Indian leaders in Brazil by saying that the church had not imposed itself on the indigenous peoples of the Americas. They had welcomed the arrival of European priests at the time of the conquest, as they were silently longing for Christianity, he said. That was May 14, uh, Reuters report. Indian leaders were especially upset by his arrogant and disrespectful comments in saying that the Roman Catholic Church had purified them, though millions of Indians were believed to have died as a result of European colonization backed by the Church through slaughter, disease, and enslavement, said Reuters. It's arrogant and disrespectful to consider our cultural heritage secondary to theirs, said Geninaldo Sateri Mawe, chief coordinator of the Amazon Indian group Koyab. Also, priests blessed conquistadores as they waged war on the indigenous peoples, said Reuters. Then on July 8, The Observer, a London paper, wrote that Jewish leaders and community groups criticized Pope Benedict XVI strongly yesterday after the head of the Roman Catholic Church formally removed restrictions on celebrating an old form of the Latin Mass, which includes prayers calling for the Jews to be delivered from their darkness and converted to Catholicism. The older rites prayers calling on God to lift the veil from the eyes of the Jews and to end the blindness of that people so that they may acknowledge the light of your truth, which is Christ, used once a year on Good Friday, have sparked outrage. Yesterday, said the Observer, the Anti-Defamation League, the American-based Jewish advocacy group, called the papal decision a body blow to Catholic-Jewish relations. Nevertheless, the Vatican allows the ceremony, and eventually Jewish criticism went away. Well, why is the Pope arrogantly criticizing others when the Roman Catholic Church is guilty of many of the sins it points out in others? What is the real agenda, especially when Rome has been pressing for ecumenical discussions with many, many religions for almost five decades? First, it is important to understand that Rome has not changed her views. She is the same as she was when she ruled the Holy Roman Empire. These actions are essentially reaffirming Rome's old ways. Second, it is also important to understand that when Rome criticizes, she is actually attempting to open the door of opportunity by reaching out to the offended and thereby placing herself in closer relation to them. It gives Rome an enormous psychological advantage with the other religions. Third, Rome is trying to shape and even control the conversation, for only when she is dominant can she work toward her desired outcome. Fourthly, 
It is interesting to notice that the Pope has now criticized Islam, Judaism, and Christian churches. This is too significant to merely be coincidental. Ecumenism has been around almost as long as the Christian church has been around. By the time of Constantine in the 4th century, there was serious compromise with the world. There was a lot of ecumenical interaction with paganism, which is a little different kind of ecumenism than we think of today. Constantine's nominal conversion expanded his ecumenism and brought many pagans into the church with him, and led to more worldly conformity, and eventually to the temporal power of the Vatican. As the Bishop of Rome asserted his authority over all the churches of the empire, both east and west, there was a corresponding growth of persecution. It started with Justinian's decree in 532, which essentially forced all to make a choice. The pure church, or those that followed the Bible and disagreed with Rome's emerging false doctrines, were forced to choose between becoming Catholic and loyal to the Pope, or becoming exiles and forfeiting their lands and even their lives. Archibald Bauer, in his book History of the Popes, Volume 1, page 334, wrote of the ecumenical movement of the 6th century. By an edict which he issued to unite all men in one faith, whether Jews, Gentiles, or Christians, such as did not in the term of three months embrace and profess the Catholic faith, were declared infamous, and as such excluded from all employments, both civil and military, rendered incapable of leaving anything by will, and their estates confiscated, whether real or personal. These were convincing arguments of the truth of the Catholic faith. But many, however, withstood them, and against such as did, the imperial edict was executed with utmost rigor. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked. Others betook themselves to flight, carrying with them what they could conceal for their support and maintenance. But they were plundered of the little they had, and many of them inhumanly massacred by the Catholic peasants, or the soldiery who guarded the passes. This is the true nature of ecumenism. Once Rome gains the supremacy, she insists that all must follow her dogmas and practices. Those who don't no longer have the ecumenical spirit and are given to the dungeon, the rack, and the faggot. Without the ability to force the conscience by governmental decree, Rome uses another secret force to move the ecumenical movement along today. Rome knows that there is nothing more powerful to unite people of different theological ideas than a common enemy. Rome has therefore made her primary distinguishing principles center around the moral decline of society or secularism. This she knows will bring Protestants into cooperation with her on many fronts on which they are concerned as well, including abortion and euthanasia, pornography, etc., she calls on all Christians to unite with her in a crusade or jihad against this common enemy, knowing that when they work together in this way, Protestants will see that Rome is no longer their enemy, but a friend. She knows that in cooperation on areas where they are in harmony, those outside of her communion will also find occasion to reduce their criticism of her teachings and doctrines, and even find common points of belief there as well. And this has indeed been the result since the Second Vatican Council, known as Vatican II, which was held from 1962 through 1965. Four future popes took part in the council's opening session, including a 35-year-old priest known as Joseph Ratzinger. Vatican II dropped the teaching that Protestants were heretics and stopped anathemizing them. They started to call them separated brethren instead and began inviting them to cooperate with Rome in social causes. Subsequently, Rome invited the main Protestant churches to begin dialogue about unity in their efforts to influence the policies of nations, so that eventually there could be better alignment with Rome in the political marketplace. This shrewd adjustment has been secretly at work for nearly 50 years. During this time, the foundation for a tremendous shift has taken place in attitudes toward Rome among Protestants. 
Forty years is not a long time at all in terms of Rome's history, but in those 40 years there has been a tremendous alignment that has taken place between Catholics and Protestants. No longer do Protestants feel comfortable using the Bible to identify the papacy as the Antichrist. After all, when working side by side to accomplish the common good of all, Catholics and the Catholic Church don't seem to be as bad as they once thought, or as the Scripture seemed to say. As a result, Protestants began to think that they had misinterpreted Scripture, especially those texts in Revelation that identify the papacy as the beast and the Pope as Antichrist. They had come up with another explanation to take the finger of condemnation away from Rome. This led them down the path of prophetic confusion and chaos. In the end, most Protestants lost their spiritual bearings and began to wander around in a theological and prophetic muddle, constantly trying to adjust their interpretations of prophecy so that they would not be offensive to Rome. Listen to this interesting statement from the Pen of Inspiration, found in Great Controversy 571 and 2. It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists, because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the Reformers. Rome has capitalized on this, as Protestants have become less and less familiar with their own teachings and the teachings of the Bible, there has been a corresponding uncertainty about the difference between them and Rome. The result has made them vulnerable to the secret forces at play in Rome's plan to retake Protestantism by getting them to cooperate with her on any areas of common interest or agreement. Worldliness has been another weakness that has made Protestant churches vulnerable to Rome. Their lifestyles don't seem to be much different than those of their Catholic acquaintances. They watch the same movies, they read the same novels, they eat the same foods and drink the same wine. They drive the same cars and live in the same kind of houses. They wear the same kinds of jewelry and go to the same amusement parks. Nothing really sets them apart unless they are truly Bible-believing Protestants that keep the Bible Sabbath. I'll continue reading from Great Controversy. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable result they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith once, de once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to Rome for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for their bigotry. Protestants even taught that the law was done away with at the cross, but eventually Rome began to urge moral reform. Rome began to promote opposition to the immoral plague of abortion, and more recently, opposition to gay marriage. These causes also concern Protestants. After all, they are good causes. How can any Christian stand apart from Rome on these? A greater and greater sense of emergency developed among both Catholics and Protestants as these evils were publicized more and more. Nothing is better calculated to unite in ecumenical effort than a common enemy and an emergency involving that enemy. A blizzard makes neighbors into friends. A war against a common foe can make even enemies into friends. Rome has trumped the Protestants by championing moral causes and placing herself as the moral authority in the world, and Protestants have yielded to the temptation to gather around Rome in the culture war in which they both see themselves as fighting Satan himself. Even many of those who don't favor Rome have come to the point where they see little danger. Catholics and Protestants now see themselves in a cosmic jihad, or a crusade against the powers of darkness that threaten to take over the world with sleaze and crime. Satan is viewed as attacking all religions, or religion in general. This has united Catholics, Orthodox, Anglicans, and Protestants, and even some Jews and Muslims, more powerfully than anything else in history. But Rome's strategy is very far-reaching. 
she has effectively disarmed Protestants in their view of her, while refocusing their attention on cooperation with her against their common enemy. This has led to the prevailing Protestant feeling that they must find a way to reconcile with Rome on other matters, such as on doctrine and even ecclesiastical matters. This new alliance has caused them to somehow love each other while ignoring their scriptural differences. They think that the opposition and persecutions of the Dark Ages will not rise again. But God reveals the true result of this thinking. A large class, even those who look upon Romanism with no favor, apprehend little danger from her power and influence. Many urge that the intellectual and moral darkness prevailing during the Middle Ages favored the spread of her dogmas, superstitions, and oppression, and that the greater intelligence of modern times, the general diffusion of knowledge, and the increasing liberality in matters of religion forbid a revival of intolerance and tyranny. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculed. It is true that great light intellectual, moral, and religious is shining upon this generation. In the open pages of God's holy word, light from heaven has been shed upon the world, but it should be remembered that the greater the light bestowed, the greater the darkness of those who pervert and reject it. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God, that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. That's Great Controversy 572. This is ultimately played out in the Sunday Law enforcing disobedience to God's Ten Commandments, in particular the Fourth Commandment, all in the name of upholding them. Rome's secret power is in her teaching that salvation does not involve forsaking sin. This subtly influences Protestants who have lost their spiritual rudder. Those who teach that you don't have to overcome your sins through the power of Christ are especially vulnerable. They will go along with the Sunday law in violation of God's holy law when pressure comes to bear upon them. Once the churches think that they can cooperate with Rome in matters of agreement, they're on a very slippery slope. They don't realize that it is part of a much larger plan to overcome them. For the scripture says that by peace, Rome shall destroy many. Daniel 8.25 the ecumenical movement is all about peace between the Catholic Church and other communions. These churches don't think very deeply. They only think superficially. Most Protestants have another weakness that makes them vulnerable, very vulnerable, to Rome's enticements. They are Sunday keepers. Protestants have adopted most of the same reasons for keeping Sunday as Rome. Rome has adopted the reasons that Protestants thought of, so that there could be better alignment on Sunday keeping. Yet Protestants are unaware, perhaps, that there is not one shred of biblical support for Sunday keeping, even though they like to suggest that Christ or his apostles changed the Sabbath. They claim this without naming a single valid Bible text to support their view. And most members believe their pastors without questioning the biblical basis of what he or she teaches. Once Protestants left their deep commitment to the authority of Scripture, which was easy to do because of their inconsistent teaching on the Ten Commandments, particularly the Fourth Commandment, they became easy prey to Rome. Originally, Rome claimed to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday, essentially by the Church Fathers, but they claim it as their power and their right to do so. The Council of Trent after the Reformation reaffirmed this, 
Protestants have always claimed a loyalty to the teachings of Scripture as the basis of their faith, but they have continued on with the traditions of Rome in keeping Sunday instead of God's Sabbath. This makes them very vulnerable to Rome's advances. Rome knows that they revere tradition as much as she does, to the point of giving tradition more authority than Scripture, just as she does. Hence, almost all Protestants don't have a clear biblical authority. Rome knows that they will accept Rome's authority in the end, because they tacitly accept it now. Furthermore, as time has gone on, most Protestants have increasingly used the new translations, which harmonize with Rome's corrupted Bible from Alexandria, Egypt, instead of their own uncorrupted version and its translations from the Eastern Texas Receptus. This has strengthened their theological confusion. As a result, what loyalty they have left to biblical authority has been reduced to Rome's Bible. All of this leads to further uncertainty in their faith. Eventually, they will face a crisis of authority and will look to Rome for guidance. Once they accepted Rome's authority over the Bible, they will have no choice but to join her at the sacramental table and strengthen themselves, not by the Holy Spirit and their convictions concerning the Word of God, but by uniting with her in worship on her Sunday. Rome is shrewd. She has co-opted many Protestants who don't understand their own faith and more dangerously don't understand their danger. They don't even realize that they're being brought skillfully into partnership with Rome in such a way as to immobilize them in their opposition to her doctrines, dogmas, and practices. They're clueless. Eventually, they will turn against those that give the last warning message before Jesus comes to come out of her, my people, and keep God's holy Sabbath day and all the rest of his wonderful commandments. They will actually think that they're doing a good thing by persecuting God's remnant people. And because they've been cooperating with Rome all along, she will easily convince them that they need to cooperate with her in exterminating any opposition to her dogmas and teachings. Where is the ecumenical movement heading? Rome is attempting to get the Protestants to accept her as the moral authority in the world so that she can compel conscience and force all to acknowledge her supremacy and worship in her way and on her day. But before we close, I must share with you the explosive statement that reveals Rome's ecumenical arrogance and Rome's real goals in reforming society. It is from the book The Liberal Illusion by Louis Vuillot, published by the National Catholic Welfare Conference in Washington, D.C. in 2005. Louis Vuillot wrote in the 19th century, defending Catholicism against liberal and secular influences. And in this statement, Rome reveals what is planned for dissenters from her principles. I will quote it now. When the time comes and men realize that the social edifice must be rebuilt according to eternal standards, be it tomorrow or be it centuries from now, the Catholics will arrange things to suit said standards. Undeterred by those who prefer to abide in death, they will re-establish certain laws of life, they will restore Jesus to his place on high, and he shall no longer be insulted. They will raise their children to know God and to honor their parents. They will uphold the indissolubility of marriage, and if this fails to meet with approval of, this, of the dissenters, it will not fail to meet the approval of their children." They will make obligatory the religious observance of Sunday on behalf of the whole society and for its own good, revoking the permit for free thinkers and Jews to celebrate incognito, Monday or Saturday, on their own account. Those whom this may annoy will have to put up with the annoyance. Respect will not be refused to the Creator, nor repose denied to the creature simply for the sake of humoring certain maniacs whose frenetic condition causes them stupidly and insolently to block the will of the whole people. 
This is the spirit that will develop once the people are reined up enough with fear and fanaticism to join with Rome on her ecumenical projects. In the end, those that disagree with the new unity will be treated as enemies of social order and decency. My friends, we are almost there. Are you ready? We can watch the movements of prophecy being fulfilled in the world and in the policies and global politics of nations. But we can also see the marshalling of Satan's forces in the movements taking place in the churches. There is more to come, so stay tuned. Now let us pray that God will help us prepare our hearts and minds so that we will not be deceived by the arguments and sophistries of the ecumenical movement. Our Father in heaven, we pray that we will have your Holy Spirit to lead us back to the scriptures. May we develop such a love for you that we will have an unshakable loyalty to your commandments. Help us not to be deceived by the ecumenical movement. As we see the unrushing events leading to the final crisis, we pray that our families and friends will accept the fullness of the truth as it is in Jesus and come out from Babylon and come into harmony with your final message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That glorious day is coming The hour is hastening Radiant light is nearing Far brighter than the sun In yonder clouds of heaven The Savior will appear Then gather all His chosen To meet Him in the air The saints that hope you have received a great blessing from this month's message. Your prayers and gifts mean much to us. Thank you for your support. The song you have just heard is That Glorious Day is Coming, sung by Melissa Collett. It is recorded on a CD with other beautiful hymns called The Way of Peace. If you would like to have a copy of the CD, just send $16 postpaid to U.S. addresses to cover the cost, and we will send you one. Our international listeners should inquire the additional cost of shipping. Please note that you want the Way of Peace CD. The following is a prophetic intelligence briefing for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ and are watching the fulfilling prophecies. We can see the signs of the times telling us that we are nearing the world's great crisis. May the Lord find us faithful. Before we begin, would you like to know more about the future popes that attended Vatican II in the 1960s? Let me tell you. They were first Cardinal Giovanni Battista Mantini, who on succeeding Pope John XXIII, who convened the council, took the name of Paul VI, second, 
Bishop Albino Luciani, the future Pope John Paul I. Third, Bishop Carol Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II. And fourth, 35-year-old Joseph Ratzinger, who was present as a theological consultant and who more than 40 years later became Pope Benedict XVI. It is interesting to note the continuity of the Vatican II principles carried out by some of the very men that were participants in the Council. It remains to be seen if the next Pope will have also attended the Council. There may well be some cardinals still alive who were there as young men. Our first item this month, Benedict promotes Sunday observance again. On September 9, 2007, reported EWTN.com, a Vatican news agency, the Pope celebrated Mass in Vienna's Cathedral of St. Stephen. In his homily, Benedict XVI reflected upon the meaning of Sunday, the day of the Lord, saying that there are two meanings, the gift of the Lord himself and an encounter with the Lord, inscribed in time on a specific day. We need this encounter, said the Pope, which brings us together and gives us space for freedom, which lets us see beyond the bustle of everyday life to God's creative love, from which we come and towards which we are traveling. Without the Lord and without the day that belongs to Him, the Pope insisted, life does not flourish. The early Christians celebrated the first day of the week as the Lord's Day because it was the day of the resurrection. Yet very soon the church also came to realize that the first day of the week is the day of the dawning of creation, the day on which God said, Let there be light. Therefore, Sunday is also the church's weekly feast of creation, the feast of thanksgiving and joy over God's creation. At a time when creation seems to be endangered in so many ways through human activity, we should consciously welcome this dimension of Sunday too the Pope said. Well, as usual, the Pope emphasizes uh, Sunday as the Lord's Day in spite of the fact that Scripture gives no justification for this. But he also emphasizes creation, which is the foundation of the Sabbath, on the seventh day, not the first day. The very biblical arguments that are clearly set forth as the basis of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment Benedict tries to co-opt as support for Sunday sacredness. This does violence to Scripture and attempts to negate the law of God. Benedict continues to press for Sunday observance because he knows that when people recognize and practice Sunday sacredness, which to a Catholic generally means go to Mass, Sunday laws will quickly follow in its path. The news article also reveals that Benedict is willing to do violence to history as well as scripture. Uh, the early Christians did not keep Sunday sacred. During the whole of the first century, Christians kept the Bible Sabbath, as taught by the Apostle Paul and others. There is no genuine historical evidence that supports the claim that the first century Christians kept Sunday. It seems that wherever he goes... Benedict attempts to spin history and scripture to suit his purposes. Of course, all in the name of love and peace. Expect to hear more of this in the future. Next, the Vatican and Israel. Catholic World News reported on September 6, 2007, that Israel's president, Shimon Peres, met with Pope Benedict XVI at Castel Gandolfo on September 6 for cordial discussions that centered on the prospects for peace in the Middle East and for a quick conclusion to negotiations toward a diplomatic accord between Israel and the Holy See. Yes, that's right. Negotiations for diplomatic relations between the Vatican and Israel are in the works. It is amazing that a Sabbath-keeping people would be so eager to have relations with the Vatican. But as you will no doubt remember, the scripture says that all the world wanders after the beast. In a brief statement, the Vatican hoped for a successful completion of the lagging negotiations toward a final diplomatic agreement with Israel. During his visit, 
President Perez renewed an invitation for Pope Benedict to visit Israel. The Vatican had already responded favorably to an invitation made in November of 2005. No date has been set for a papal visit, however. Vatican insiders suggest that the Pope probably will not make a visit until the diplomatic accord is completed. Next, wiretaps foiled terror attacks. The BBC News reported on September 11, 2007, that the U.S. Director of Intelligence has said wiretaps played a significant role in stopping bomb attacks by suspected Islamists in Germany last week. Michael McConnell told a Senate committee eavesdropping had re revealed that the suspects had obtained explosive liquids. He said Congress should not restrict the program. It allowed us to see and understand all the connections to al-Qaeda, Mr. McConnell told a hearing of the Senate Homeland Security Committee. The comments by Mr. McConnell were an attempt to pressure Congress not to restrict the new warrantless eavesdropping program, which was started by President Bush in the early days after September 11 attacks in 2001. Now, six years later, with the tentative support of Congress, the President has been able to legally support his unconstitutional program. Of course, the government ought to be able to do surveillance on legitimate targets. But this can be done and has been done for years through the special courts that exist for this purpose. They can move very quickly. But the president has argued that it is not quick enough and wants to be able to conduct the spying program on U.S. citizens without accountability to anyone. This opens the door for abuse and the loss of constitutional rights, as predicted in prophecy. This is just the latest round of justification for a process of undermining constitutional law, replacing it with inquisi inquisitional law. Next, violence and music connected in Colorado. On September 3, 2007, the New York Times published a story about nightclubs in Colorado Springs, Colorado. After a spat of shootings and with a rising murder rate, the police here are saying gangster rap is contributing to the violence, luring gang members and criminal activity to nightclubs. The police publicly condemned the music in a news release after a killing in July and are warning nightclub owners that their places might not be safe if they play gangster rap. We don't want to broad-brush hip-hop music altogether, said Lieutenant Skip Arms, a police spokesman. But we're looking at a subcomponent that typically glorifies, promotes criminal behavior, and demeans women. The actions of the police have angered the hip-hop community here. If we were talking about a rock bar or a country bar here, none of this would be happening, said James Baldrick, who runs a local hip-hop promotions company, Dirty Limelight. But with 19 homicides already this year, compared with 15 in 2006, the police insist on a correlation between gangster rap and violence, and point to three recent shootings. Next, presidential power has risen to amazing heights. In an article called Commanding Heights, Charlie Savage of the October Atlantic Monthly told of a meeting in January 2001 of President Bush's lawyers with Alberto Gonzalez, their new boss. He told them of the new president's two priorities. Number one, put conservative judicial nominees quickly into the confirmation pipeline, and two, seize opportunities wherever they lay to protect and expand presidential power. Gonzalez said that the president wanted to make sure that he left the presidency in better shape than he found it. While this may have seemed like an attempt to repair the damage to the image of the president after the scandals of the Clinton administration, it turns out that it set in motion a far more sweeping change in the realization of Vice President Dick Cheney's dream of restoring what the historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. had called the imperial presidency the era of unchecked executive power that peaked during the Nixon administration. 
The power grab involved a broad range of unconstitutional issues, such as the power to imprison Americans without charges, to bypass laws such as those governing wiretapping and torture, to set aside the Geneva Conventions and scrap other major treaties without consulting the Senate, and more. It has rebuffed oversight and has expanded secrecy, and it has tightened White House control over federal agencies through the explosion of signing statements appended to new legislation, instructing the executive branch that it can ignore vast swaths of laws that restrict the president's authority. While it may seem as though the new democratically controlled Congress and some Supreme Court actions may have curbed some of this overstepping power in recent times, Mr. Savage pointed out that the Congress only has limited and politically difficult options for resisting executive overreach. More interestingly, Mr. Savage pointed out that it isn't just the Bush administration that has been guilty of building the power of the president's office. Administrations from both parties have developed new powers, including Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and Bill Clinton himself. Indeed, he said, presidential power has been mostly growing in fits and starts since World War II. Harry Truman set the precedent for overseas wars without permission from Congress in Korea, and Dwight Eisenhower first used state secrets and executive privilege as a method of avoiding congressional oversight. And by exploiting the sense of permanent crisis that surrounded the early Cold War, presidents of both parties cowed both Congress and the Supreme Court, which President Bush has done with the war on terrorism. Mr. Savage then makes a powerful observation. During Bush's first six years, a friendly Congress largely abandoned oversight while passing laws that broadened the president's power over detainees and strengthened his ability to impose martial law. Today, Congress has changed. But those laws remain on the books, and the administration's departure from traditional restraints and its novel assertions of power are now historical precedents. Then quoting 1944 Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who warned that each new assertion of executive power once validated into precedent lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Every repetition embeds that principle more deeply in our law and thinking and expands it to new purposes. Herein lies the prophetic problem. What today is developed to deal with terrorism will eventually be expanded to include anyone that is publicly villainized, including perhaps God's faithful servants. Mr. Savage also observed that in the six decades since 1944, presidents of both parties have seldom hesitated to use all the powers available to them. Then he asks a sobering question. What will future presidents do with the arsenal they will inherit from Bush and Cheney. Prophecy tells us that all these arsenals will be used against the small minority band of Jesus' followers, who refuse to place tradition above the law of God and obey human authority. Next, the European Union is now an empire. We are a very special construction, unique in the history of mankind, said Manuel Barroso, president of the European Commission, at a press conference on June 10. Sometimes I like to compare the EU as a creation to the organization of empire. We have the dimension of empire, reported the London Telegraph, July 11, 2007. Barroso went on to say that empires were usually made with force, with a center imposing diktat, a will on the others. Now what we have is the first non-imperial empire. It is interesting to note that Barroso speaks of the new European empire as an empire that does not force its will on the people. We have 27 countries that fully decided to work together and to pool their sovereignty 
Any fears that countries will lose their sovereignty to an EU superstate are unfounded, said Barroso. Barroso was promoting the EU Reform Treaty, which is really a constitution without a constitution-sounding name. Reuters reported on June 26 that the long but relatively readable constitution was turned into a short but complex document designed to be incomprehensible to citizens. One negotiator boasted, saying, We made a real effort to be opaque. What are they trying to hide? Why all the deceptiveness? The EU Commission has been trying to find a way to force the new empire against the will of the people. Dutch and French voters rejected the Constitution, but now it is being resurrected as the Reform Treaty. Had the people of most of the other nations of the EU had opportunity to vote, they would have likely rejected it also. But their leaders simply signed the treaty without a referendum. Though there are still strongly divisive issues, they're mostly about voting rights and processes, not whether the Reform Treaty Constitution is legitimate. The July 11 Telegraph also reported that Barroso warned Britain not to renege on Tony Blair's commitment to the new constitutional treaty. He said that the new Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, is honor-bound by the agreement signed at the June 23 summit in Brussels. There is a principle of good faith. For me, it is as important as any legal commitment, he said. It is inconceivable that an agreement that was agreed unanimously in June is reopened now. Apparently, the new prime minister is getting a lot of flack for denying the British people a public referendum on the new treaty. Tony Blair signed the reform treaty without giving his own people the chance to decide whether he should sign or not. It sounds like Barroso is saying that the whole of Britain is supposedly honor-bound because one man signed the treaty regardless of the wishes of the people. The so-called honor must only be between the conspirators who are trying to arrange things so that the people will not have a choice. Marc Francois, Britain's conservative shadow Europe minister, made a poignant observation. The British public will be surprised to hear that we are now part of an EU empire. For the president of the commission to say this is quite startling, and anyone who thinks that we have been exaggerating in calling for a referendum on a revived constitution only has to look at what Mr. Barroso has said to realize the scale of what is now being contemplated. Stratford commented on June 8 that Europe is in the process of moving to the right of center politically and is becoming much more conservative, and then said, a right-leaning Europe could be united under one leader, particularly since the states are brought closer together by common problems such as immigration and economic reform. But it remains to be seen which state will emerge to lead and in what direction. While previous swings to the right in German history preceded World Wars I and II, this one has larger implications. Prophecy tells us who will lead the empire and in which direction it will go. Though Germany appears to be positioning itself to lead the economic and political side of the emerging empire, the Vatican is the only nation-state that is positioned to rise above the political squabbling of the European nations and provide authoritative moral fo focus and direction. She does not have a direct interest in their petty squabbling, but uses them to power her own purposes. Partnered with Catholic Germany, the papacy will have a strong chance to politically maneuver the new empire into partnership with her and under her control. We've already documented how the European leaders are attempting to Christianize the Constitution. Those who have been watching the development of the now-acknowledged European Empire can now confirm this agenda from the mouth of the President of the European Commission himself. The papacy is about to emerge as the powerful leader of Europe. Keep your eye on these significant developments. Next, Europe undermines national sovereignty. 
Germany has recently changed its corporate tax laws so that German companies can compete more powerfully in the global marketplace. But another change has just recently been made that will again help corporations to improve their competitive edge, but will also advance the rising European empire by diminishing national sovereignty. When the euro was introduced in 1999, the common currency provided a lot of strength for businesses by reducing their costs, but which also has increased its profits as the euro has gained strength against other currencies, particularly the dollar. Now a new law, engineered by Germany, changes the way electronic payments are made at the beginning of 2008. The Single Euro Payments Area, or SEPA as it's called, provides a 2-3% to savings to the European economy by considering all such payments as domestic. It will reduce costs and increase the speed of payments across national borders. According to Hans-Joachim Massenberg, Deputy CEO of the Association of German Banks, in terms of its dimension and significance, this revolution in European payments is comparable only to the introduction of the euro, he said. The new payment system will also hasten the process of making Europe one nation or empire, as opposed to a group of nations working together. A Europe-wide domestic concept will blur those national distinctions that have kept Europeans squabbling and bickering for centuries. Expect to see European businesses getting stronger, but also for Europe's new empire status to strengthen itself at the behest of Euro business enterprises. How can Europeans resist EU agendas when the economic changes, at least for a time, seem beneficial? How does this play into the hands of the Vatican? The EU leaders have been attempting to get the new empire to acknowledge the supremacy of the Christian faith in the forthcoming constitution. Though for a time this has been delayed, it will one day become reality, perhaps. The papacy is attempting to position herself above the nations of Europe, even though she is one of the micro-states that are part of the EU. A consolidated Europe is the only way that the Church can become the guiding moral voice of Europe. Next, prisons purging books on faith from libraries. One important work that is done in many places around the world is prison ministry. But some important developments are taking place in the United States. Prison chaplains have been quietly carrying out a systematic purge of religious books and materials that were once available to prisoners in chapel libraries, reported the New York Times on September 10. The chaplains were directed by the Bureau of Prisons to clear the shelves of any books, tapes, CDs, and videos that were not on a list of approved resources. In some prisons, the chaplains have recently dismantled libraries that had thousands of texts collected over decades, bought by the prisons or donated by churches and religious groups. The Bureau of Prisons said it relied on experts to produce lists of up to 150 book titles and 150 multimedia resources for each of 20 religions or religious categories, everything from Baha'ism to Yoruba. The Bureau of Prisons was responding to recommendations resulting from the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. The Bureau and Agency of the Justice Department defended its effort, which it calls Standardized Chapel Library Project, as a way of barring access to materials that could, in its words, discriminate, disparage, or advocate violence, or radicalize. No doubt there will be some good things on the list, but will the list experts choose books that reflect that final message to the world, or will it be more generic Christianity or even ecumenical Christianity that will be chosen? When certain books written to address the spiritual adultery of the great harlot of Revelation will be construed to be disparaging or discriminating, these may not be led into the prisons where they can actually 
do much good. We really wanted consistently available information for all religious groups to assure reliable teachings as determined by reliable subject experts, said a bureau spokesman. Well, it isn't hard to understand that reliable subject experts will not likely include those that have a knowledge or an understanding of the truth for this time, and will look only for mainstream literature that is ill-suited for the important times in which we live. Next, Big Brother watching even more. On September 15, 2007, the BBC reported that the U.S. and the U.K. governments are developing increasingly sophisticated gadgets to keep individuals under their surveillance. This is much more than a multitude of cameras watching every street corner. It involves integration with computers and software models that pinpoint physical characteristics and even the thinking processes of those under surveillance. Gate DNA, being developed at the University of Maryland, is when computers create digital code for the way an individual walks. They can also use computers linked to cameras to determine height, weight, and other elements so that a computer will be able to identify a target instantly. As you walk through a crowd, we'll be able to track you, said Professor Chalapa, the leader of the research team at the University of Maryland. These are all things that don't need the cooperation of the individual. Over at the Pentagon, even more sophisticated technology is being developed. According to Tony Tether, the director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, the Pentagon is developing technology that allows for soldiers or anyone outfitted with the technology to comprehend what is going on around them in whatever country without having to learn the language. A very small computer will do the translation. I hope in the future, said Mr. Tether, we'll be able to have conversations. If, say, you're speaking in French and I'm speaking in English, and it will be natural. What about total surveillance? Mr. Tether insisted, that's not science fiction. We're developing an unmanned airplane, a UAV, which may be able to stay up five years with cameras on it constantly being cued to look here and there. This is done today to a limited amount in Baghdad. Interestingly, we the public don't seem to mind, said the BBC. Opinion polls, both in the U.S. and Britain, say that about 75% of us want more, not less, surveillance. Some American cities like New York and Chicago are thinking of taking a lead from Britain where our movements are monitored round the clock by four million CCTV cameras. But it goes even further, even to reading what is on your mind. So far, there is no gadget that can actually see inside our houses. But even that's about to change. Ian Katajima, a researcher in Hawaii, is working on sense-through-the-wall technology. Each individual has a characteristic profile, explained Ian, holding a green rectangular box that looked like a TV remote control. Using radio waves, you point it at a wall and it tells you if anyone is on the other side. It turns out that the human body gives off such sensitive radio signals that it can even pick up breathing and heart rates. First, you can tell whether someone is dead or alive on the battlefield, said Ian but it will also show whether someone inside a house is looking to harm you, because if they are, their heart rate will be raised. And ten years from now, the technology will be much smarter. We'll scan a person with one of these things, and we'll tell what they're actually thinking. Do you think you can hide from all this? My friends, when your faith becomes the enemy, unless you're under the protection of God, you cannot hide. It will be up to the angels of God to protect you. Your responsibility is to be faithful. The Lord will care for the rest. Our time has run out. It has been a great pleasure to spend this time with you, and I hope you have been encouraged to live for Jesus, for we are near the end. 
Thank you for your prayers and support, and until next time, may God bless and keep you and your family in His loving and protecting care as we near the end. Keep the faith.